Take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. Do we feel our need for righteousness? Uh, Most people do. Now, they might not say it that way. It's usually spoken of in a way that highlights our works. All religions think this way. It is the mark of all false religions. All false religion requires some kind of deed or deeds on the part of the adherent to be accepted by their deity. And some of these are moral works and some of these are sacrifices for failure. And some even require evil deeds to be accepted by their false god. What about us? What about you and I? Are you depending on your own version of works? Are you secretly thinking that God uh, God will accept you if you just do what he says? This leads our author, Paul, to ask a question. How were the Old Testament saints saved? Specifically, how was Abraham justified? Now, this is not a a burning question for most of you. Nobody got up this morning and thought, you know, I really wonder how, how did the Old Testament saints have a right standing before God? I wonder about that. Maybe pastor will answer that this morning. But understanding our own salvation, our own right standing before God, is dependent on our understanding of how the Old Testament saints were also justified. For at the end of the day, we were all, Old Testament and New Testament saints, justified by faith. So Paul's thinking about our salvation. Abraham then is the model of justification. These paragraphs that we look at this morning in verses 1 to 25 of Romans 4 are almost exactly parallel to Romans 3, verses 12 through 29. They also expand on his responses to the objections that closed Romans 3, So, in our text, verses 1 to 8 develop what we saw in verses 27 to 28 of chapter 3, and show then that the reason God justifies by faith is so that boasting would be excluded. Verses 9 to 12 in our text develop verses 29 and 30, and show that ultimately, circumcision or whatever religious rite you want to insert there, makes no difference. In verses 13 to 22 in our text, develop verse, chapter 3, verse 31, and show that ultimately faith fulfills the law. So in this, Paul is continuing to show the integrity of the gospel and, most importantly for the book of Romans, the unity of Jew and Gentile in Christ. The argument of this chapter is structured along the lines of bringing forward examples of justification and connecting them to important texts in the Old Testament. So, though this larger section began with, but now, signaling that we are in the new, justification by faith has ever and always been the way of justification. And so our author begins with Abraham not justified by works, verses 1 to 8. Paul writes, What then shall we say was gained by Abraham by our forefather according to the flesh? If Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as what he is due. To the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness, just as David also speaks of the blessing 
from, of the one to whom God counts or imputes righteousness apart from his works. David, uh, Paul quoting David, verse 7, Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Now he begins with a historical reality. If Abraham was declared right before God by the works he did, then he has grounds for boasting. But the scriptures in Genesis 15, 6 say that Abraham believed God and righteousness was credited to him. This is what the scriptures say. That makes it final. Abraham was not circumcised by what he did. He was not, circum- he was not justified by what he did. He was not justified by his circumcision. He was justified by faith. God says so. Moses wrote it so and David said so and Paul affirms it. So what is its scriptural basis? Why is faith the way of justification so that we cannot boast? Because if justification were given because of works, then it would be on the basis of a wage earned. We would have earned it. Our works then would put God under obligation. Reverses the debt of our sin and makes God a debtor to the sinner doing good. This is not the blessedness, the happy holiness of the Old Testament saints. Even David in Psalm 32 verses 1 and 2 understands that God credits or imputes or puts to our account righteousness when we believe and when we stop trusting our works. You see the powerful effect of of Paul's argument? Here are the two central phrases for the fostering of your faith. To you who turn from your works, to trust the God who declares the unjust to be righteous on the merit of Christ, great is your blessedness. And your blessedness is like that of David. When his righteousness, the righteousness of God, is credited to you, apart from anything that you do or have done or could ever do. And then it's personal application. So to have a right standing before God, you must turn from trusting your works to believing in and trusting in Jesus Christ. Abraham was not justified by works. David was not justified by works. No Old Testament saint was ever justified by works. And but now that a righteousness apart from the law has been revealed, no person has ever been justified by works or by the law. No one is justified by what you do. But great will be your joy when you simply embrace Christ alone as your righteousness from God. Abraham was not justified by works. Dear friends, neither are you. Abraham was not justified by circumcision. Verses 9 through 12. Paul continues, In this blessing then, is this blessing then only for the circumcised? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? Now, let me pause here. See, we won't feel this. We, probably all of us are Gentiles. There might be a Jew, Jewish person here. So, so what was huge for the first generation of the church, we look at this and go, well, what's the big deal? We'll apply in how we think about this in just a moment. Listen to this, though. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. In effect, 
Abraham was justified while he was still a Gentile. How about that? He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he already had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised so that righteousness would be counted to them as well and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised but also walk in the footsteps of the faith our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. Oh, the wondrous wisdom of God. Abraham believes before he was circumcised, so he might be the father of the uncircumcised. Then, as a righteous man, he is circumcised, so he might be the father of those who believe and have been circumcised. That makes him the father of all believers. In one sense, again, we don't feel the impact. Probably few of you were brought up to believe that being circumcised brought you into a special relationship with God, making you and identifying you with his people. But many in Rome and all over the world believed this was so. The gospel comes to them to say that you cannot have a right standing before God by circumcision. How do we know this is true? Well, as Paul points out, Abraham was declared righteous before God by faith before he was circumcised. And the shocking thing that Paul is insisting on is that Abraham was saved while he was still a Gentile. That doesn't shock us. But you better believe most of the Jews sitting in the room in the first generation were going, what? Now there's some important implications. There are some huge implications from this simple fact. And two of them Paul draws, and I want to indicate additionally. First, circumcision then is a sign and seal of a faith already exercised. God gave him an outward right that reflected an inward reality. So the integrity of the gospel is upheld. Even in the Old Testament, Abraham is saved by faith. Abraham is circumcised because his faith obeys God. And secondly, Abraham is the spiritual father of all who believe. God designed and revealed the timing of Abraham's justification by faith so that all who believe are united in that faith. So the unity of those who believe the gospel is upheld. Abraham is not merely The father of the Jews. He is the father of all who truly believe. And so, no religious right can save. The connection between circumcision and baptism is often used by some to prove that maybe infants are to be baptized or that baptism saves you. Loved ones, regardless of where you stand on this issue, know this. Just as faith preceded Abraham's circumcision, so faith must precede any religious right for it to have any value. Abraham was not justified by a religious right, and neither are you. And Abraham, not justified by law. Verses 13 to 15. Paul goes on to explain, For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be the heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if the adherents of the law who who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and righteousness and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Those are two problems. So, so notice what Paul says. First, um, <clears throat> excuse me, Abraham is not justified by law because he is believing God's promises. Paul advances his argument by showing that the promises to Abraham were not a matter of the law, but a matter of faith. Abraham does not have and is not given the law. He does not know the law. The law was not written when Abraham believed. The law was not available 
Now, when Moses wrote that Abraham believed the law existed, no one before Moses had the law. He has a promise from God. Abraham does. And believing that promise, he is declared righteous. And if we turn to the law, if we place ourselves outside the promises of salvation given to Abraham, who is the father of those who believe, we nullify faith. So believing God's promises is how Abraham is justified And then Paul deals with then the problem of nullifying God's promises. You see, the function of the law was to describe righteousness and to condemn unrighteousness. The law has no power to save us. I most clearly come to understand this in relation to the law of gravity. We have a law of gravity which describes what we believe it is what effect it exerts, and what happens when we violate the law of gravity. The words in a textbook will not cause you to fall from a tree, but they will describe what will happen if you jump from the tree. You do not go up. So the law describes the Old Testament law, the Mosaic law, describes righteousness and what happens if you are unrighteousness. Just as the law of gravity tells you certain things, and if you try to violate it, you will learn painfully and powerfully that that law is ever present anywhere you're near an object in time and space. The law cannot, cannot make you righteous. Only Christ can do that. That is the function of the law, to expose your guilt before God and to point you to your true Savior. Abraham was not justified by law. Dear friends, you cannot be justified by the law. And Abraham justified by faith, verses 16 to 22. Paul goes on to say, this is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent to the law, but also to the, to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all, as it is written in Genesis, if you will, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. In hope, he believed, against hope, that he would become the father of many nations, as he had been told, so shall your offspring be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was as good as dead since he was about 100 years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God. Fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why his faith counted to him as righteousness. So Abraham being justified by faith upholds grace. Justification is by faith so as to uphold faith in God's promises which, bring, which is brought to us through grace. It brings to us the favor and enabling power of God. Salvation is a promise, a promise to Abraham and to his heir. Paul sees the words of God's promise that Abraham would have heirs and would be a father of many nations as pointing not just to Isaac, And not just to many sons who would be born as a result, but as pointing to all nations. And yes, there is a physical genealogical descent, but once Christ came as the descendant and the new Israel, then all those who believe and are in Christ are spiritual sons and daughters of Abraham. And not only does it uphold grace, but it gives hope. 
When we read that God justified Abraham by faith, we have a growing hope. Because he believed God, believed he, because he believed God, God granted him a son when it was naturally, physically impossible. He's a hundred years old. Sarah is barren. And yet, beyond all natural hope, he believes what God says that God will grant him a son. Out of Abraham's deadness, God brought forth a new life through the birth of a son. So we are assured that God will bring to life many sons. These sons will have faith like Abraham's faith. And so not only does it uphold Grace, and not only does it uh, give hope, but it models faith. Abraham's faith models for us believing God's promise in the face of impossibilities, verses 17 to 19. This is the measure of true faith. He understood the impossibility of his own situation. He did not waver in believing God's promise because he was fully persuaded about the power and perfection of God. Power in that God would do what he had promised and perfection that God had staked his name and reputation to keeping the promise that he had given. There is no law yet. And in this way, he gave glory to God. So there's no law yet. Abraham is a sinner who has fallen short of God's glory, who needs a right standing before God like all of us. And God calls him out and gives him a promise to be believed and trusted. And Abraham believes that promise by faith. Believing God's promise by faith glorified God. So God credits righteousness to Abraham's account through the faith that he exercises. Verse 22. Now this makes Christianity different from all religions in the world. The Bible tells us, if you will believe the truth and promises of salvation in Christ, and you are willing to bow to him as the Lord and sovereign of your life, that you will be saved, you will be delivered from his wrath, and that you will be given his righteousness. You will have a right standing before him. There's nothing you can do. There's nothing you're called on to do because there is nothing you can do. So Abraham believed God's promises, thus glorifying God and being declared righteous before God by faith. You can be righteous in God's sight Only by faith alone, in Christ alone, for God's glory alone. Abraham was justified by faith. Dear friends, so are you. And Abraham was justified for our faith, verses 23 to 25. Paul writes, but the words, it was counted to him, We're not written for his sake alone. I guess not, because Abraham was dead when the words were written. But for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord. Abraham believed that out of the deadness of his body, God would give him a son who would be life. We believe that God out of Death raised up his own son, Jesus Christ, for our justification. Who was delivered up for our trespasses, our Lord Jesus Christ, and was raised for our justification. So notice, as we teach here all the time, the Old Testament is for us. How do we leap from Abraham's faith to our own? The for us purpose of the Old Testament is at the center of this paragraph. We're supposed to read the Old Testament in the light of the cross. Yes, there is an old and new, and it's accompanying discontinuity, 
There are also massive things that teach us what it means to be God's people. These things about Abraham in the Old Testament are written for our sake also. The great object of Abraham's faith that he saw so dimly in the Old Testament has now been fully disclosed in the New Testament and in Christ. The promises that he received of salvation for all people groups, we are now enjoying the fulfillment of that promise. We are living in the day that Abraham believed God for. And the pattern example of unwavering commitment to God's promises and power and perfection is a God-glorifying faith. So what is its present reality? At the heart of our faith is not a son, an Isaac, out of personal deadness, Abraham and Sarah way beyond childbearing age. At the heart of our faith is a resurrection from the dead. Our faith believes and trusts in the death. He was handed over for our transgressions. And in the resurrection, he was raised for our justification. Here Paul, once again, reiterates the gospel. But we must believe in God who raised Jesus our Lord. So faith moves from facts to trust in God himself. You can have that very same right standing before God by faith. Believe in God's promises of salvation in Christ. And bow to him as your sovereign ruler. Now let's think about this as we wrap this up this morning. First... This is not faith in faith. This is faith and trust and believe in God. So much religious talk ends up being about the power, the wonderfulness, the availability, the what faith does for you. And it just simply becomes faith in faith. Well, I have faith in faith. But that isn't going to save me. I have faith in God and believe His promises. That is what saves me. Faith itself does nothing. It is faith in God that justifies sinners and glorifies God. And the issue, once again, is a right standing before God. The problem is that we do not glorify God and the punishment is the wrath of God. And the provision is the death and resurrection of Christ. And the principle is faith that believes and bows. And the purpose is to end boasting and to glorify God. And so, as Paul has taught us in Romans this morning, Abraham was not justified by works, and neither are you. Abraham was not justified by a religious right, and neither are you. Are you? Abraham was not justified by law. Neither are you. Abraham was justified by faith. And so can you. You believe and bow this morning. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. And thank you for how it cuts across our human desire to work and therefore be able to boast and brag about what we have done. Grant saving faith and repentance through your grace and your spirit to people today. May those of us who have believed be strengthened and take joy in and thus in that glorify you for the faith of Abraham and David and all the saints of old, and all the saints in the New Testament, and the long parade of your people who will one day gather before your throne for your glory.